Dr. Are you available with video and voice as well? All right, we'll hopefully get that sorted in the background so that we can hear from it. That will be an important thing to do. All right, but we are actually going to go ahead and jump in and get started. For those of you that are here for one o'clock, it's one o'clock my time. I don't know what time it is your time, but here we go. Okay, cool, Missy. Glad that helped. All right, here we go. We're going to jump right in. And if you are looking for the presentations, you're going to get sick of us saying it, but we are going to keep putting it up there. You can go to our website and forward slash presentations to find these as PDFs. All right, we are starting with just a real quick overview of a little bit of what you all heard this morning. So I'm gonna give you a rundown. This is not gonna be a surprise or a secret. We're gonna start with a revisit of what changes that are specific to FTD, seeing it from both sides. So care partner versus person living with and or anybody else who's in this mix because we're all living under this umbrella. Pack skills that support, we're gonna identify what are some of those pack skills that we wanna try out for people who are living with this type of dementia and then pick your pack. So you are going to pick something, one thing, anything that you're going to try out and get better at with practice over the next little bit. So no surprises, this is what we're doing. Let's do a quick run through and overview. I'm gonna stop sharing and see what you guys remember. I'm gonna look at the chat. And so go ahead and feel free to chat and let us know if you really wanna be in this space, if you're either someone who's living with FTD or something else. Um, but what are things, if you attended this morning's session that you know are true about frontotemporal dementia? Anything that you can think of from earlier today? I know it feels like a lifetime away. Not always a memory issue. Nice, Missy, that's something that's really sticking out. Ooh, apathy, Tipa talked about apathy early on. Something about five subsets, can't remember the details, but there's something there. Ooh, that feeling of a loss of self. Can't quite find myself. Ooh, great. Ah, I don't feel versus I don't care. Empathy versus apathy. Impulse control, personality changes, wow. You guys are doing great, man. Compulsion, positive experiences, wow. Relationships are becoming more difficult. You, I think you've got all of mine. Man, I didn't need to even go through this. You guys have got it. Ah, uh, there's that often misdiagnosis. And hopefully we can get Anne on here so she, oh, it looks like she might be coming on in, in sound yeah. and picture very hard to identify hey there Ann. all right cool so yeah you guys have got it one of the big things that we talk about um and ann mentioned this and she helped me put this together so i'll let her kind of share out too about some of those oof, very noticeable relationship changes because this time we're less focused on the specifics of the of this particular type of dementia and more about what does this mean for our relationships because often this is a partnership or a team and our relationships are really important. So anisognosia that out of a hundred percent of people living with dementia close down one whole hand, 50% of people living with dementia are unaware. And with FTD, I don't know the stat but Anna's letting me know it's, it's more significant in the FTD world. That lack of awareness that I have brain change in myself. Anisognosia, and then apathy. Ooh, yeah, apathy. The, the look that I don't care. The outside appearance that I don't care. Trouble getting started trouble understanding, reading body or visual cues and understanding what that means, addictions or repetition, physical altercations and potentially lack of impulse control, 
medications and misdiagnosis. Man, you guys got almost all of those. And is there anything else that stands out that you want to share out from this morning that really has changed relationships when it comes to living with this thing called FTD? Unfortunately, you've got to unmute for us to hear the amazing Sorry. things you're saying. It's all right. There you go. Probably the only thing that I mentioned this morning that wasn't on the list is a sense of empathy. How do how do I understand how somebody else feels? And I mentioned this morning that I would actually go, I don't feel it, so I would actually go to a movie that was um, um, a thriller or a horror movie just so I could feel something. So this idea of feelings not necessarily being about the other person at all, but I'm having a hard time tapping into my own emotional connection. Yeah. So then you asking- feel it. You don't feel much of anything. You don't feel like crying when you should be crying. You don't feel happy when you should be happy. Yeah. And yet when someone else is looking at that from the outside, it's, it looks like a choice. You're, you're yeah. choosing not to feel those things. You're choosing not to do. Before diagnosis, were you demonstrative? Did you show your emotions a lot? Was this something that was common or has that really significantly changed? I would say it was much more common. Mm -hmm. When it started to change for me, I just... It's hard to describe, but I just didn't feel much of anything. So it, it's, it was sort of a slow trickle effect. So it's, it's that idea, uh, and I've used this example for a lot of different things, but for those of you that put your swimming suits away for the whole winter, and over the whole winter, you gain a couple pounds here and there. Oh yeah, by a little bit, little bit by little. And then next summer you go to open up that place where you've kept all your swimsuits and you <laughs> suddenly it doesn't fit. And you're thinking, but it's just been a, a little bit. It's just been a little bit, but a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit adds up to a lot. And so the changes are gradual, but eventually it really starts to become, I'm having a hard time feeling just about anything, anywhere, with anyone. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. So what we're gonna do today in this afternoon session is really start to dig into how do, how do we make connections then? Because the things we used to do, the feelings we used to tap into, the emotions we used to see aren't there, but it doesn't mean that I'm less desiring a connection with you, less wanting to be connected and, and have a relationship. It's just, I, I, I'm having trouble tapping into the things that I used to be able to just pull right up and feel and notice and be aware of. So we're gonna figure this out. Yeah, cool. Thanks guys for who are chatting. If there's anybody who wants to join in, um, let Dick know that you'd like to be switched over, like Rebecca and Michael, if you are interested in joining the room, feel free to come on in. All right, so here we go. Here's something that um, I presented a little while ago, Rebecca, Ann and I were talking and we talked about how sometimes people think that with FTD, the care is actually gonna go, the difficulty of care, is actually gonna go down because I am less strong, I'm less able, I'm less... And in fact, what we realized is it's not that simple. There is no simple graph that can show how difficult care will be for any one type of dementia. Because as Tifa mentioned, when you know one person living with dementia, you know one person living with dementia, and each person's journey is gonna be different. So I might, have a care journey that starts out what feels very difficult and then it gets harder. Or I might have one that starts out feeling very difficult and then it gets easier. 
or I may just require similar levels of care all the way through because we don't truly know what to expect until we're in this thing and in this journey. And one of the best ways we can identify what this journey is gonna look like is by taking a look at our agenda, knowing what we wanna get done, knowing how we wanna get it done and putting it in that back pocket and instead presenting a relationship first focus. Because this relationship is what's gonna get us through this thing not how good you are at getting these tasks done. Because these tasks are gonna just keep going and keep going and keep going because we each need different things every day. And yet if we can focus on how we're feeling about each other and how successful we are in our relationship, we're gonna be a lot more likely to get some of these things done and make our journey, while not easier, more pleasant for both of us along the way because there is no easy or difficult. Whenever we're trying to care for ourselves or someone else, it becomes a bit of a tricky situation if we're not thinking relationship first. So here's something that um, we focused on for a lot of other components throughout the day. Um, and many of you might've seen some of these slides depending on which session you were in this morning. But the reason that we're showing this section of brain, if you were to take sort of like you were gonna wear a headband and you were just sliced down here and you lift it up high and you're looking at it, what we're looking at is a healthy brain upon death and a brain that had lived with Alzheimer's for many years. But what's interesting about this section of brain, we show the temporal lobes. And when you hear frontotemporal, hopefully you can notice that there's the word in there, temporal. There's also frontal, frontotemporal. We've got two different components and within temporal, man, we got two different sides of the brain. So if you tap on your temples, that's where your temporal lobes are located. And so one variant of FTD that you might've heard about this morning is, is more temporal changes and you've got right and left, you can see with Alzheimer's, left is always much more affected and right tends to be a strength that tends to stay for longer, almost all the way through this, this dementia. For FTD, if you have a temporal variant, man, it might be one of these two components that get sort of changed early on. So, when we look at what might happen with a temporal change, we've got a lot of different things that might be going on that are not similar at all to the progression related to Alzheimer's that we noticed in the last one. Primary progressive aphasia, also known as PPA, but the, the, with the, the, with, you, with, uh, with the, uh, my rhythm of speech has actually gone away early on. And so with these different changes that you'll be noticing with a temporal lobe variant, hmm, how might this change a relationship early on? And I'm gonna stop sharing and reach out to Anne and Michael, if there's anything you guys want to share about noticings, because what you guys might have noticed about Anne is Anne does not have a strong temporal variant. So Anne, what would you like to share about this section? I would, uh, the one thing I'd like to share is that while in the beginning, you can have behavioral or, or word problems, or even like an ALS type of thing. Eventually, when you get towards it getting really worse, you get all of them at the same time. While so it may thing, be all separate in the beginning, as time goes on, you add more of that on. 
So when so it's an FTD, together. cool, thank you for sharing that. So when it's an FTD, you might start with a variant that starts somewhere. So it might start in the left temporal, it might start in the right temporal, it might, but one thing we know is true about all dementias is they progress and they continue to change your brain. And so while it might start somewhere, eventually it's shifting somewhere else. And eventually it will change, especially in those FTDs, frontal and temporal components of the brain. So where we start is important to note and to be aware of, but it's going to change and shift. And so if we're not expecting a change, then man, we might be caught unaware. We might be caught surprised. And I might not notice a shift if I'm not looking for it. Thanks. Some of the people with PPA or whatever, they stick with that, but then all of a sudden they tend to have the behavioral variant that shows up eventually. Absolutely. So again, this scale of saying, how difficult is this journey gonna be? It's gonna be different for each person. And the level of care that I require is gonna be different and it really depends on what's the journey that my dementia in my brain takes. Great, thanks for bringing that up. Michael, was there anything you wanted to share about this piece? No, okay. All right, cool. So when we shift into temporal lobe changes, these are something that we'll notice right away in our care partnering, in our relationships. We'll notice shifts that are really obvious because we as care partners like to rely on what to do most of our care partnering or caregiving. I'll switch to caregiving. How do we do deliver most of our cues? How do we deliver most of our instructions? How do we tell people what to do and show people? Well, yeah, Mary's giving us a good visual. We talk and 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 talk. We really like to rely on our words. We like to rely on words to help people do things, to help people understand what we're going to do. And in many of the dementias, but especially with FTD, if we rely on our words and you're having a really hard time with comprehension or losing all of the consonants, when I ask you to do things or tell you what we're going to do, a lot of my words are not making sense. They're not getting through. So when I'm trying to now, let's shift over. When I'm trying to now explain why we need to put coats on, why we need to do this, why we need to do that, we're now shifting into a temporal lobe change and go ahead and touch your forehead, a prefrontal cortex change. So frontal variant with temporal lobe changes. FTD is frontotemporal. And so often what it sounds like when we're trying to convince someone to do something, we're trying to tell them, we're trying to explain to them, hey, we're gonna go outside in about 25 minutes and it's a little colder than I think it was this morning. If you would just grab your jacket so that we can make sure that we're ready to go. Also on your way out the door, if you wanna grab um, a few other things, uh, because I don't know if you want gloves or a scarf or something else, it's a little bit colder than it was earlier. So you may be wanting that, but I mean, it's it's not as cold as it was earlier in the year. So, you know, I don't know if that's, if it's, you you like what? it. What? Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> you talk a lot. Just leave me alone. Just, just go away. Oh boy. And so what I do when I start to get anxious and I know my words are not sinking in and I know that you're not getting my language and, and I, I start to notice these things and, and what's my reaction? If I'm not careful, it's to talk louder and faster and move quicker. So if you learn nothing else in today's session, everybody do this. That's how we like to give information. Everybody tap right here. And pull back on the reins. If we can do nothing else, then stop firing our words out and hoping they stick. And instead, have a little impulse control. 
and try something different. That's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna see what we can do to stop firing so many words and use what else we got because we don't only have words. We have a lot of other ways to give information. And if we keep that relationship first and that agenda in our back pocket, we're gonna get a lot further along this way. So here we're gonna shift into trying something different. So being logical and reasonable, it sounds pretty simple. It sounds like something that we all do, right? Um, how would I notice if I've got some changes happening? And then how do I support if I can't explain the situation to you using just language, what am I gonna do? So here's a question for you guys as people who are watching and you can chime in in the chat and everything else. So you're staying alone in a hotel room for a few days. You walk into the kitchen and find the milk sitting on the counter. Okay, what do you think is happening? So here are some options. When you see this, you see the milk sitting on the counter. First, you may have forgotten to put it away this morning. Second, someone probably snuck in and left it there. Third, the housekeeping staff are stealing your things. And fourth, there's a little boy trapped under the counter with cookies. Okay, so Donna's saying, I can't believe I left the milk out again. So probably that first one. Okay, yeah. Seems like a very logical and reasonable conclusion. You've come to a logical, yeah, probably I forgot it. What if you're thinking that, I know, right? A fancy hotel, you've got your own kitchen, right? Now, what if I, as your well-meaning care partner, come in and here's what I actually say. Um, this is not your hotel room. This is, this is my hotel room. What are you doing here? No, this is my hotel room. No, no, you, you're actually, you don't live here. This is, I'm staying in this room. What are you doing in my space? This is, you're in the wrong room. No, I'm not. This is my room. You need to get out. Ooh, okay, so what happens when someone comes in and presents an alternate reality? How does that go? Oh, yeah, you would be angry. You would argue, maybe some fear. Yeah, because who's right, Teffy or me? Hmm, I think I'm right. And she thinks she's right. Shoot. So if I'm expecting someone else to see my point of view and my reality, and I'm not willing to let go of being right and get you to understand what's logical and reasonable in this world and what's happening right now, and that doesn't even make sense. Why would you even think that? Uh-oh. How's this gonna go for us down the road? Because one of the biggest struggles when we're talking about FTD is this part of my brain, this prefrontal part of my brain, one of the skills there is being logical and reasonable and seeing the world as you see it and, and understanding that, yeah, okay, well, that makes sense. Based on all of this data, I'm seeing exactly what you're seeing. And if I have a partner who's not willing to let go of being right, and my brain literally cannot let go of being right, this is what I am seeing. I'm seeing it. I'm, this is my room. I, I've been staying here for three days. What do you mean this is your room? What are we going to end up doing over every single little thing?
So what are some strategies? What are some techniques that we can try out? So when you walk into that room and it's not your room, when you walk in and you realize, and, and Teffy's telling me that the housekeeping staff have been stealing it, or there's a, a little boy probably who just left it here and, and her brain, it's called confabulation. When I don't have all the pieces, my brain doesn't like that. How many of you have found uncertainty in the last eight months to be the biggest downfall? Yeah, it's really hard. It's really hard to not know what to expect and, and to have the whole story and to know what's happening next and what's happening next. Your brain doesn't like it and it fills in the gaps. It's called confabulation. And the cool thing about it is you wholeheartedly believe it because your brain told you it's so. Uh, unfortunately, it may or may not be accurate. And so where we get a little bit tricky is, oh man, your reality and my reality don't match. And so I am being logical and reasonable in my conclusion. It, it just doesn't match what you want it to be. So how do we do this differently? So Teffy, if you will, if you'll unmute and we'll go back to, okay, so I've, I'm standing here and I'm, I'm seeing her standing in my room. And so this, I say, this is my room. Oh, this is your room. Yeah. Oh, you were thinking this was your room. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can see it looks a lot like your room. Yeah, because there's the milk that the boy left on the counter. The boy was leaving milk on the counter. Yeah. Yeah. So, Teffy, were you looking for something or trying to find somewhere to be? Uh, it was, it's the something, the... Um, you were looking for something. Yeah. Something to drink or something else? Yes, to drink. Cool. Milk or something else? No, no, something else. I, the, the milk... It goes in. Something else. Yeah. Let's go look. Okay. Pick something out. Whew. Okay, so what did I want to do when we had a mismatch in what was happening? She says first, this is my room. Instead of arguing to prove I'm right, this is in her room. You're right, it's not a room. Does it matter? So the very first thing we wanna do is let go of being right. Cause being right doesn't help any of us. Being heard, however, will help me support her and figure out what it was we were actually trying to do. So I come alongside I use what she's giving me, whether they're the right words or not. I give her back to double check and I offer some choices so we can move forward in this journey. All right, let's shift back and let's learn a little bit more. Let's see a little bit more about what's going on here if we're more in a frontal variant. So again, impulse control. Oof. Um, and I'm wondering if you would share a little bit about some experiences that you've had where impulse control might have been a challenge. Probably in the beginning, my biggest challenge was, was spending too much money. Um, I would buy like, thousand dollars in in um towels and stuff oh yeah because you probably needed like lots and lots and lots of towels right yeah and then <laughs> i would just throw them away and go buy new ones because it felt so good mm -hmm. feels so good yeah so eventually in the FTD world, eventually what happened is my husband put uh, limits on credit cards so I wouldn't overspend. 
Yeah. So it became a conversation. I couldn't control it or I would eat. I've lost two, um, two sizes of clothes because I used to just eat, eat, eat carbohydrates and stuff. Absolutely. So you've got this, this thing happening in your brain. So everybody go ahead and do this. These are your amygdalae and they're like in the center of your brain and they're part of your primitive brain. And they're in charge of three things. First one, threats, making sure you know what's a threat. I can see a snake and I don't step on it because <gasps> that's a threat. I can see that the burner is hot and I don't want to touch it because it's hot and it will burn me. I can see that these are stairs and I don't want to just topple over. So I'm going to take my slow steps down. Safety awareness, threat perceiver. It also is in charge of ah, pleasure seeker. And in that needs meter, but my brain chooses which things it tells me I need tells me I need food. And what does the brain like most when food or energy gets involved? Sugar. Because sugar is the quickest glucose burn that my brain can get. So when I take in alcohol, when I take in sugar, when I take in carbs, things that are very sweet or filled with quick energy burn, my brain says, oh yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Oh, Taffy's got her sugar going right now. Sugar feels good. And, and my brain, my, my primitive brain will tell me if a little was good, you know what's better? A lot. <laughs> take it in, take it in, take it in, take it in. And the only part of my brain that can tell my amygdala to rev it down you don't need another one of those. It's not, you don't absolutely need it. You're not going to die if you don't get another drink of wine. You're not going to die if you don't spend enough. You're not going to die if. The only part of my brain that does that is this part of my brain. It's Are you my sure impulse. you're not going to die? Right? Are you sure? Wait, 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 wait. Maybe you'll die. Let's, you, let's do another one just to be safe. Oh, man. It's a sneaky part of the brain. It's, it is the source of all addictions in healthy brains because if you override that prefrontal cortex enough, if you tell it to back down and you do one more anyway and one more anyway and one more anyway, and some drugs and some things actually override it. And over time, that's where that addiction piece comes in. And FTD notoriously, whoosh, Let's rip off that impulse control straight away. And that's one of those pieces that my amygdala is ruling the roost. So being really open and honest is really hard because just like with other addictions, I don't, I don't want everybody to see that I'm, I mean, I know it's out of control, but like it's, it's feeling really good. And, and this is where it gets really hard to have those open, honest conversations with somebody that is your partner. And yet, if we can set it up and be aware of that, it looks like a choice. And in reality, I'm doing what my brain is telling me I need to survive. So finding ways to set limits without it feeling like I'm putting a cap on you. It's really hard. Um, and you talked a little bit about um, the strategy of making sure that the, the limit was set and that you can't do over that. What about for things like food and what have you started doing for yourself that might be helpful for some other people when they go grocery shopping? Well, don't, don't buy the things that you don't want to eat. That's number one. Okay. If they are the in the house. The thing is, yeah, don't have it in the house. Or if you do buy something, put it away in a cupboard so you're not looking at it all the time. And so it's like, if you want a cookie for the day or like that, you don't have to deny yourself, but you don't have to look at it all the time. That's one way to kind of deal with it. 
because if you see um, it, you'll you'll you will not have the impulse you, control. You get stop. the impulse going then. If you see it, you get the impulse going. If you don't see it, it you, it's a little bit more manageable. But um, but not denying yourself of everything, but finding ways, putting your your three cookies mm -hmm. out on the table instead of um, you know putting the bag out so that you remember to have one later because then you know by the end of the day the whole bag will be gone instead exactly. get out just what you want and then close it away so it's not visually obvious right great, great strategies anything else you're thinking of um i would say in overall that especially with ftd routine is very important um it is with a lot of dementias, but especially in FTD, if you don't have a routine of things like uh, get up at a certain time or go for a walk or whatever, if, if you, people really need a routine and things that interfere with the routine like COVID and things like that, that interfere with the routine can really be a difficult problem with people that have FTD. So the finding these routines so that you're not driven by what you see and the impulses on a moment to moment basis and realizing and being aware that having that structure allows this part to engage in a functional way because if I just leave it to freedom and open and then this guy's going to come in and charge the way through and i'm going to be told what i need by the mm. primitive brain because this part's having a hard time connecting and, and stopping me and pausing wow thanks all right let's shift into what this might look like for you guys so what might this look like if we're trying to notice it in either ourselves or someone else? So the person in front of you in line has underwear visible as an outfit choice. This was clearly a choice that they made. And you can put yourself somewhere where it's, that's maybe not a choice that you would have made. Maybe you choose to have your underwear visible. That's That could be your choice, who knows? If it bothers you, so this is in a place where this is not what you feel is appropriate. Do you roll your eyes where your partner can see? You might whisper something to your partner once the person walks away. You might whisper to your partner loud enough for the person to hear you. Or you tap the person on the shoulder and say that the outfit is inappropriate to them. Which one is more like you normally? Because when we talk about FTD and we talk about impulse control, it's important to know what your standard is. Because if you're the kind of person that will turn to that person in front of you who you've never met before and you have absolutely no connection to other than that they happen to be in front of you in line and you feel that it is accurate and appropriate to tap them on the shoulder and say, excuse me, miss, um, not sure if you're aware of this, but that outfit choice is really inappropriate. Um, that's important for me to know as your partner, because that's not a drastic change from who you've always been. And as Anne said, this kind of change happens sometimes fairly slowly over time, or sometimes might be fairly rapid in my ability to control my impulses. If you don't know where I fall on this scale, just because you wouldn't do it doesn't necessarily mean that I wouldn't have always done this. So just do a quick self-assessment. Where do you fall in this level of impulse control? What is right? for you to do in this situation. Because when you notice a change in someone or yourself from what you used to think was okay to what we're experiencing now, that's when you wanna go, hmm, this is different. 
because normal aging might push me to a place where I say it. I just say it louder than I meant to say it. I thought we were far enough away that the woman in front of me couldn't hear, but I, I did it anyway, and she did, and she turned around and looked offended, and I go, Ooh, sorry. But a lot of the time, if that's not who I've ever been, and then I start doing this, especially in public forums or in places in places that you feel are inappropriate, ooh, now we're getting into the place of, man, who has to have impulse control? Because the moment that I say something inappropriate and you turn to me and go, oh, you can't say things like that. Who forgot their impulse control? Who tapped on the person's shoulder next to them and said, that's inappropriate. We don't do that here. That was us. That was me. I'm supposed to have the healthy brain and oops. Impulse control can get us because we don't realize we're doing it until it's already come on out of our mouth. And go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say another impulse with FTD that is very common is, is um, so um, sexual impulses. Okay. Um, I was at a fundraising for an FTD uh, event, and the um, couple of the people brought their FTD spouse with them. And this one guy put his arm around me and I thought um, his wife was just going to um, have just, she just rolled her eyes and was just like panicking. And, and I told her it was okay because I understand these people, okay? I know he can't help it, you know, but, you know, I, I'm, I know this guy who gets kicked out of, um, Lowe's gets kicked out of uh, other groups or whatever for inappropriate uh, sexual advances and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and you're you're pointing out something really, really hard. And it's for a really lot of people. hard for mm -hmm. some of these people, and it's not talked about very much, but it's very common in FTD. Yeah, because just like all of those other things that your brain is telling you you need, this yeah. is one of those things because it's a pleasure seeker. And if you look friendly and I see a part of you that looks lovely and I don't have impulse control, yeah, you don't have the filter there. Oh man, I'm going to every time do what? If I see it, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna reach out and touch it. So for those of you who are in a care situation where sexual inappropriateness, and that's the term that we like to put on it. And as Anne said, man, that doesn't feel fair. <laughs> And yet we'll boot people out, we'll throw them to the curb, we'll, we'll call them out and make them feel really bad and we'll point the finger a lot. My question is, how many times did you come up and stand right here within arm's reach and say, hey, good morning, how are ya? What the hey. hell did you want me to do? Nice boobies. Oh. And Teffy's being very friendly because she's in Zoom world and she can't actually reach out and touch. And however, if I was actually within arm's reach, who started this interaction? Who intrigued you? Who, who ignited your amygdala to go, hey, you hoo pleasure here. And I didn't mean to, but this is what you can see of me. And I'm within arm's reach. And what's the very next thing that I go to do? Take your pants off. And I think I'm doing it for what? A care task. I'm here to change your pad. I'm here to take you to the bathroom. I'm here to offer a shower. And yet 
you see me and I'm taking your pants off. What does your brain think is happening? Woohoo, party time. And yet we're really quick to point the finger. So we're gonna come back to that one because that one is all about positive physical approach. First and foremost though, with impulse control especially, because we're gonna make a lot of mistakes. Whether you're the care partner, whether you're the person living with, we're gonna make a lot of mistakes when it comes to impulse control. Because we have a lot of old habits and routines that maybe aren't the most healthy. Maybe we snap to judgment. Maybe we say something we didn't mean. Maybe here's the skill that we're gonna practice real quick. So I'm sorry, I was trying to help. So say it out loud, everybody on the call, say it to the space, say it to me, say it to the world. I don't care, but get yourself to say, I'm sorry, I was trying to help. Because even if I can't feel what you're feeling, I recognize when I've made you mad. Even if I can't have that empathy, I do want you to be happy. I just don't always have all the skills to do that. And I'm gonna make those mistakes time and time again, because the part of my brain that is in charge of saying, whoa, isn't doing what it should be doing. And the part of your brain that's supposed to say, whoa, that's probably a change related to the dementia, isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. And so I get out my finger, and I point it at you, and instead I want to say, I did it again, shoot. You're right, mom, I'm sorry. That shouldn't have happened. I was, I was trying to help, and I got wrapped up in the fact that we're in this store and that that lady wasn't wearing what you thought she should be. At. I'm sorry. I, sh I should never have said that that was inappropriate. I should never have told you that, that you did something wrong. You were, you were not trying to make her feel bad. Sorry, I made you feel bad. Because it's really important for us to recognize I'm not trying to make you feel bad and you're not trying to make anybody else feel bad. We're all doing the best we can and we're all gonna make a lot of mistakes, especially when impulse control is involved. All right, let's go to the next skill. We've only covered two skills so far, and yet, man, there's a lot of places here where we can practice some great skill. Okay, the next one, making choices. We've kind of talked a little bit about this one along the journey. Um, making choices is one of those pieces that how many of you, when you think about going to a, well, way back when, when we used to go to restaurants, remember that? Oh, it's a long time ago. Anyway, when you go to a restaurant and they hand you a menu that's like a flip book, usually it's like a diner or something with lots of different options. And they have like maybe a whole breakfast page and then there's a lunch page and then there's like six dinner pages and you've got to figure, how many of you get so overwhelmed that you actually just set it down? And you just say, tell me what's good. Yeah. And some of us who are really skilled, you, you pick out two things that you feel like, okay, I could eat these two things. Let me ask them which one is the best one. And you usually don't ask the waiter for a choice of six or seven, you pick two. Brains like it when we make choices really easy and helpful by offering this or that, this or that, this or that, this or that. So with Teffy and the milk and trying to figure out what she was looking for, it's this or that. Are you here looking for something or you were looking for somewhere to be? You want something to drink, milk or something else? It's, it's a this or a that, a this or a that. Too many choices will overwhelm even healthy brains. 
but it is one of those skills up here in this prefrontal cortex that we can support with. Now this next one, this next skill here is again, pretty important to our day-to-day -day living, especially when we think about care tasks that we do for ourselves, self-care tasks. So here's one that we're gonna think about, um, steps to brush your teeth. So imagine yourself, you're standing at the sink. You've got all of the tools that you need in order to brush your teeth at the sink with you, everything's ready to go. And in this situation, I came up with 16 step-by-step -step tasks. Go ahead and think through what your task would be, right? Because it's not just pick up the toothbrush and go, you've got a lot of other steps along the way. All right, so somebody, anybody, give me a number, whatever the first number is, we're gonna eliminate. Any number one through 16, I guess. Don't pick a random number outside of 16 because that will not, eight. Okay, eight it is. So we are going to now eliminate number eight and see if we are successful. Brush all sides of teeth. Okay, so if we eliminate number eight, we've got the cap of the toothpaste off. We pick up the toothpaste. We turn the bristles towards there. We squeeze a piece as a mouth. We screw the cap back on. We open our mouth. We insert the toothbrush bristles first. Then we spit excess saliva and toothpaste into the sink. What happened there? Did taking out that step allow us to clean our teeth? No, we got, we got some toothpaste in there. We, we put the brush in, but if I don't actually brush all the sides of my teeth, then what happens to my mouth care for that day? Yeah, I went through all these steps. I did all this work and yet, the core piece, the one major piece, and I promise I didn't tell her to say number eight, because look at any of them. Any of these numbers, any of these steps, if my brain is having trouble getting started with a task, sequencing through it accurately, finishing a task and moving on to begin another task, how many self-care tasks, am I going to miss a step, miss the key part, miss the whole point of the activity when I'm only missing one of 16 steps? Yeah, ooh, great point, Helen. So I'm gonna pause here and ask the room if there's places or spaces where you've noticed that man, these sequences aren't what they used to be. And, and I have, uh, before you guys, I'm gonna give you a little moment to think and then you can share out because um, our friend Lauren, who you've seen on a lot of the calls has a story that just is so perfect for this part of the brain. It's really funny, but it's really frustrating. So her and her friend who went to the day center together, they were, she was a nurse for many years. So anybody who's a nurse, you know, with the rubber gloves, you can blow them up and make a balloon and do fun things with them. This is what nurses do apparently. Having not been a nurse myself, I did not realize that they just had playtime, but now it sounds like a lot of fun. Anyway, she had the brilliant idea. We've got these gloves, we've got some time. They want us to play balloon volleyball. Let's make it a little bit more fun because um, for real balloon volleyball again, Let's do it with gloves so that at least they look like people flying through the air. So Lauren with Lily Body said, I'm not real good at the um, blowing part, but I can tie them. And he said, well, I'm not real good with the tying part, but I can blow them. So let's, let's work together. We'll do them together instead of each of us doing a balloon on our own. So she went to tie the balloons that he had blown up and realized it was really hard to get them tied you know what, it's easier to tie them before he blows them up. So she tied them and then passed them over. And then they both paused to realize you can't blow them once they're tied. So sequence matters was her moral of the story. 
because just because it's easier, because I can get through some of the steps, if I can't get it in the right order, I'm not gonna be able to complete this task no matter how good at each step I am, no matter how good at it I am. If I get the steps out of order, the task doesn't get done the way it should. So Ann or Michael, any sharing out of things where you've noticed that this sequencing or this step-by-step -step or this putting things in the right order, whether it's a self-care task or just getting through your day-to-day, -day, and you mentioned routine really matters. What are some of the strategies that you guys have set up or where have you noticed them? Uh-ohs. Uh -oh. uh, for me, I, I have to tell you, uh, I'm not sure whether I have FTD, but the more I listen to you, the more it sounds like I do. Uh, I, I was originally diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but they then switched to semantic dementia. Uh, as I listen to you, I, I can tell you one of the problems I do have, especially brushing my teeth, a lot of times I confuse whether I should be spitting it out the mouthwash or stuff or swallowing it and I have to think so hard about doing that step because I've already done it and swallowed it and boy let me tell you it's not good it's not good no that's not a good thing to swallow and I really have to force myself as I'm doing by brushing my teeth not to swallow which it, 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 it it's really it's weird but counterproductive I of everything you've ever done with yeah. liquid in your mouth you don't generally spit things back out right so yeah, so this idea of these things that we think are so simple. You brush your teeth every day. I've done it every day of my life since I was, I don't know how young. I've kind of done it the same way. I really haven't changed how I do it. Now I use an electric toothbrush instead of a regular one, but the, the actual motions of it, I've been doing almost my whole life. And yet, each step is so complex and we just lump it all into brushing your teeth. That actually your brain is working overtime on every single step of the way. So that's something that we, we as people forget that it's really actually quite challenging what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Each of the things that we do are actually quite complicated. Yeah, thanks for sharing. That's a really tricky one going against everything we've always done and how much thinking power it takes to get through each and every step. Any other, and anything that you were thinking of? No, not in this one. So when we find these challenges in the prefrontal, how do we help? How, how do we sort of help someone along the way with this piece, with, with not being overbearing and not saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. Because what is our go-to when we try to help someone? I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you each step of the way. And how's that going for everyone? Do you think Michael's not telling his own brain Spit, don't swallow, spit, don't swallow, spit, don't, is me saying it gonna actually help? Not so much. I can say it and it might help in that moment, but what do I wanna really try adding in instead of just firing words at him? A visual cue, Ooh, Tuffy's got some great visuals going. Oh, shoot. So if she's having a hard time with something, what might I wanna give her to help her with the next step? I can say, hey, take the cap off, take the cap off, take the cap off. Doesn't really hit home. And yet if I can, ooh, Mary's giving a good clue. Take the cap off. Yeah, twist it. What's the difference between take the cap off and twist it? How does my language change help or hurt in this situation? 
yeah, take the cap off. That's A, a lot of words, but B doesn't actually tell you what to do. Twist it. I don't have to do any explanation there. Her brain can go, oh, watch and do, watch and do. Yeah, four versus two words, exactly. So we're going to take a look at a video of Tipa supporting someone through. Sound. Oh, right. Thank you. I'm going to share sound. It's an important thing to do. Thank you, Dick. All right. Uh, we're going to take a, take a look at a video. Uh, hopefully this is the right one. If not, you'll be on this journey with me as I explore and find the right one. Nope. You might even you might not ask people how I did so well. I have some support here helping me with my sequencing. How did he know to say that? What steps does he know that I miss often? Yeah, Tuffy's got it. Anybody who's watched our live at five will know that this is one thing that I am very bad at. I just am not good at remembering that next step. And yet, because I said before I did, I'm gonna show a video, he was helpful in reminding me of the one step I miss. So now we're gonna watch um, Tipa support Susie through this process. And I want you to notice the number of times that she cues and how she cues. All right, so before they even got to the activity of brushing teeth, what did they need to finish or complete before we can move on? Finish the song. Yeah, you got it. And for those of you who are in the occupational therapy world or physical therapy world or just know stuff, um, why might singing on the way to brush teeth be a good activity to try. Yeah, we've got some good rhythm going. What else does singing require you to do? Yeah, you got it, Emily. I'm priming, and, I'm priming the pump. I'm getting things moving. I'm getting this muscle memory started before we even get into the space where we're gonna do this thing, which I am prepping for. I'm noticing, yeah, I might notice that there's movement happening in the body, so I wanna be aware of that. But this is getting me moving before we even start the next activity, but it was important to be able to finish the song. And before we looped around to another song or another verse, we can transition the activity. So Tipa stopped singing, and now we're performing a transition and a new start. So let's see how she does this. You don't know? I'll help you. Will that work? I've got your toothbrush. Really? And I've got your toothpaste. Good. I'm going to open up the toothpaste. Here, I'll have you go ahead and put it on. Let me switch to the other side. Okay, so for those of you who are, um, have done some work with positive physical approach, she's switching to, um, Susie's dominant side. Because how many times do you think you've brushed your teeth with your non-dominant hand? For me, maybe once when I like broke my pinky, um, but that's it. <laughs> Other than that, the whole my whole life I have used my right hand, for me it's my right hand, to brush my teeth. So if I know which dominant side I need to be on, I want to go ahead and start there because my goal and Tipa's goal is always you do as much of it as you can. I am just there to notice and bump up to the next step. Notice and bump to the next step. Visual, then verbal, 
then and only then if needed touch. So let's see how we keep going. Turn this way for me. I don't know that I can do that. I'll help. All right. Okay. All right. Here we go. We're going to put the toothpaste on. You hold to me and I'll put it on. Okay. There. You got it? All right. There. Now let's put the lid back on. Okay. Okay. Take the lid. All right. Have you got it? Here's the. Okay. So what are you noticing about Susie's verbal cue pickup? Is she picking up all the words that Tipa is offering? Take the lid. What has she got right now? Not the lid. So now it's time for Tipa to start making sure she matches her visuals and her verbals. You hold the toothpaste huh. there, and I'll put the lid on and turn it on. Good. I don't want it. Good. And we'll lay it down right there. Okay, so how did she shift that cue there? Did she just say, lay it down right there, or what did she offer? A real clear, clear visual through line of sight so that Susie knew where to put it. There. Unfortunately, what do you notice about the coloring of the sink and the edge of the sink and the ability to, yeah, it's all white. Man. So how do we help figure out where to put it? Let's check it out. Right over here. Yeah, that'll work. Good. Okay, now. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and let's brush your teeth. Uh, no thanks. Here we go. You ready? Let's try. Ready? There you go. Oh, Let's try putting it in the side. Try it here in the side and see if it feels better. You ready? Open. There you go. Okay, now she's saying I don't like that and I, probably you wouldn't like it either if it had been two weeks and it's, what do you know about toothpaste and drier lips? Yeah, it can be kind of minty and a little bit burning, right? Yeah, it stings. That's a great descriptor word. And so where's a safer spot to start? Where do you generally start when you're brushing your teeth? So everybody pause for a minute and pick up your toothbrush and think about where do you start? Do you start here or do you start in the back? Is it important to know? Yeah, usually on your dominant side and your back is your most well-brushed tooth area. And you kind of have to force yourself to do the rest of them. So that inside back molar area is a good safe place to start. Also, this part of our face and our body is one of the most sensitive areas. This front part of the mouth is one of the most sensitive areas that you can touch. And so not starting here, we're kind of warming up the juices, just like singing before we start an activity like this. Now we're priming the pump for getting all of the teeth, but we start where it's less uncomfortable. There, now you're doing a great job. I imagine this will feel better when you're finished. Hmm. Let's do the other side. I sure don't like the way it feels. I know. It tastes better when you're done, doesn't it? Good. Good. Hmm. Good. Okay. Good. Okay, let's get the inside. You want to spit in the sink? Huh? Spit in the sink. Lean nope. forward. Step forward. That's it. Now spit in the sink. I don't want to sit in the Okay, so where are we having a language mismatch? Spit in the sink. And she says, I don't want to sit in water. Yeah, sit and spit. Boy, do they sound real similar. And those consonants are getting lost. And so I, she's hearing sit in the sink and that doesn't make sense. And that's not the next step. And oops, what did Tipa realize she didn't do here? Give a visual cue. She was thinking, oh, we're doing all right. We're doing okay. Let's do the next step. And the next step she just did verbally. And Susie's going, wait, I'm not sitting in the sink. I don't want to sit in water. So let's see how we how we recover here. Water? No, you don't want to sit in water? No. Okay. No. So again, that reflective strategy, give her back what she gave to me so that I can make sure I heard your message. You're not going to sit in water. 
this is Tipa's I'm sorry. It's an understood I'm sorry here, not an out loud I'm sorry, but it's an I got your message. You're not gonna sit in water. I hear you. I meant for you to spit. Okay. It hurts. Let's try the other side. It hurts my gum. Yeah, we'll do it real easy. How's that? That's not quite, That's as, not bad. quite as bad. Let's get the, behind your front teeth. Okay. Let's do your uppers. You ready? You're doing a great job. That's it. Ugh. Let's get that one. My left. lips are burning up. Let's get that last side, and then we'll rinse your mouth out. Mm. Let's get right over on this. It hurts. Does it? Yeah, yeah. You want to rinse it's out? Burning up. Here you go. Let's rinse your mouth out. Let me get you some water. Lean up. You want to spit? There you go. All right. So. What are some of the strategies that you're noticing Tipa using when we're needing support in those steps? And, and obviously we're needing a lot more than simple verbal cues. What are some of the strategies that she's using? What are you noticing? Yeah, Joni's saying she went back to the step before where, where she made an error and she just used a verbal cue, she went back and picked back up where we were to see if we can keep going through. Nice, visual cues showing the water, validating that this is not nice, this hurts, you don't like this. But also not saying, okay, well, let's not do it because what's the reality? Does it feel good to have mucky teeth for weeks on end? No, that's not gonna feel good either. Validating, giving some space, and then coming back to it in a place that was more comfortable, starting in the back again, before we shift up to that front. So when we're supporting someone through these steps, what would be one of the most important things to note about the person that you're trying to support or yourself? How do you brush your teeth? Do I know that? Have I watched you? Do I give you the opportunity to try it out and notice which pieces? Yeah, Tevi's giving us a cue. Which hand are you dominant in? How do you get dressed? Do you put your pants on first or your shirt on first? How do you take a shower? How do you do these things? And especially if we're earlier in this condition, we want to note this stuff because if I'm going to be supporting later on and really truly care partnering, it'll go a lot smoother if I know how you already do it. And yet, how often have you turned to your partner and said, hey, which part of your body do you wash first in the shower? Which part of your teeth do you brush first? Do you prefer to eat the soft stuff first or the hard stuff first? Do you like pop with dinner or water? What, how many of these preferences do we actually check out? Especially early on when we can still do a lot of this as a conversation. But even if we're not there, what can I do while you're doing some things and step-by-step -step sequencing? Yeah, I can watch and learn from you. And by placing the tools in your hand, I can at least maybe make a better guess as far as what you normally would do first and then support you in that task if needed. Yeah, when do you brush your teeth? Great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when do you do this in the day? Do you, are you a morning shower or an evening shower? Are you a shower once a week kind of person already? And so pushing a shower on me daily is going to make me crazy. Are you just a wash up and pits and whatever the, I forget the phrase that Tipa always uses, the high point, hit the high points. Because if that's where you are and I'm trying to come in and force it how I do it, we have very different hygiene routines. So as a care partner, again, pulling back on those reins to go, is this what I would want? Or is this how my care partner would do this? Is this what I think should happen or is this how they would do it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. 
We're going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to go back into my PowerPoint. So now we're getting almost there as far as accurate self-awareness. Again, really starting to look at, man, am I actually accurate that I've got this situation? Am I actually accurate that I know what to do and how to do it? Or could I really use some help in this situation? So Anne and or Michael, wondering if either of you guys have um, a time when you noticed you thought you were good to go. You thought everything was working how it should be working. You, you felt like you had things under control. And then whew, really quickly, you realized, man, I, I, I should have, could have, would have asked for help. I kind of got myself into a situation that I thought I was good. And I realized, ooh, I, I should have asked for help or I could have asked for help. Well, for me, that sometimes happens uh, when I do some tasks that I used to do without an issue, uh, like just painting for that matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, you, you get started and you, you run into problems. And if there's nobody around, you, you end up making a mess of things, too, because of it. Oh, uh, man. You know, I used to be big into electronics i won't even attempt to touch that anymore because anything i do just goes poof oh, man. you know you know electronics is not forgiving so you, you learn to kind of stay away from the things you can't do anymore yeah you you can only throw a laptop so many times across the room and still expect it to work right yeah <sighs> um so are we talking about people living with dementia here or are we talking about all of us and those moments of i thought i had this and in fact, I should have asked for help, but I didn't. And any any memories or times where that happened for you? Well, I, I at one point I was losing a gas cap once a week. Okay, and uh, I would tell my husband, and then after a while, it was sort of like I didn't tell him anymore. I would just go buy another one, okay? Because <laughs> I didn't want him to start yelling at me, you lost another one? How did you lose another one? Well, you know, I guess I left These it on happen. the car or something <laughs> like that and drove away and, mm -hmm. Uh-huh, yeah, and, and it's not until it becomes a habit or a pattern that you really start to get frustrated and concerned about it because something like that the first time oh, it's annoying the second time it's also annoying but you're like Gosh, shoot I should have I should have known that by the fourth fifth sixth time it's beyond annoying and you're now in in cover mode right like let me not know let anybody else know that this is going on because mm -hmm. I am self-aware enough to know that that's not what should be happening I just can't for the life of me figure out how to make this yeah. different. Why I can't, why I do that every week, I don't know. <laughs> <sighs> so everybody do that, everybody go. <sighs> Cause this thing is really frustrating, especially when memory is not the first part to go. Cause it's not a memory issue. It was an orientation task type of thing. That's what it was more. Yeah, and now we, on top of this sequencing piece, I'm, I'm having trouble with the tasks and the, getting all the things and the steps in the right order. And I get all of them up to a certain point. And for the life of me, I can't do that last step of putting the gas cap back on. I, I don't know why I, sh I should be able to do it. And I just can't do it. I can't get myself to do that, that spit instead of swallow. I, there's one thing that just keeps I keep getting stuck in this thing. And, and then we get super frustrated because mm -hmm. ah, it should be different. And I, I notice, again, the last skill up there, I notice that I'm making you upset. I notice that I'm making you angry. 
but I'm having a hard time showing it. And so mm -hmm. I might even laugh or just not care at all to you. Mm -hmm. And yet I, I do, I mean, I'm, I'm so worried. I am so anxious about it. Every time it happens, I realize it. And I, I have this moment. I, I, I just can't show you what I'm feeling and thinking in that moment. So with FTD is one of those pieces that so many care partners end up looking and reacting in just the same way as the person who's living with this thing. In most situations, it is hard to tell who's who because we let our emotions go high and we hold on to being right. So let's shift gears for the last little bit here and let's talk about what are some strategies that we can try to help in a different way that isn't belittling and it's not uh, expecting something of you that you can't give and it's not just yelling because that's whew, also frustrating. So here are some things that we're gonna try out. We're gonna try them in short order because you guys, I can't see everybody who's out there giving stuff to try. Um, but I am going to hope that you try this stuff out and you stand up and you do it. So we are going to shift and try out positive physical approach. So I'm going to have Teffy be my approachee. And we are going to practice with someone more in an emerald state, meaning that, you know, there's some language that's being lost, which means that I want to limit the verbal unless I'm giving a good solid visual cue. Binocular vision, so she's got limited vision intake. So I wanna do what I'm doing. Luckily your, your computer actually gives you binocular vision because you really can't see anything outside of your computer screen, which is pretty much central field vision. And I'm gonna show some step-by-step -step cues instead of just jumping right ahead. And I know Teffy has some tools there, so we're gonna try those things out. All right. I'm gonna pop this up for just a second for those of you, if you'd like to take a picture or something else, go for it. I'm going to try this though, and I hope that you will stand up and try it with me. All right, let me unplug. And let me stop sharing. Okay, here we go. Oh, Teffy's got some cookies there, that looks good. Okay, so my camera is angled down because Tuffy's seated. So I'm gonna show you what this would look like. If you would like to try it also with someone who's seated, if you've got someone to practice with, great. If you don't, angle your camera down a little bit so that it's like they're seated. All right, and the key here is, I'm gonna angle it up just to touch so you can see my head. Okay, the key here is starting at six feet out starting at six feet out because when I start here, again, what am I setting myself up for? Physical touch that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, thanks Tuffy. <gasps> and then I get surprised and I can no longer think. If I wanna truly be helpful, I need to provide myself and yourself enough personal space. So it should be two arms length. So I'm gonna be about here. When I walk in and enter, I'm gonna stop moving. And I'm gonna say, knock, knock. Wait for her to look. Hey, Teffy, it's Amanda. 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 What's the very first thing every time we have an interaction? Her name, my name, her name, my name. Because what's one of those things that's really hard to come up with in many dementias, especially a temporal lobe dementia? Names. Why make me work at it? Why make me think about it? Why make me try to figure it out? Can you offer it in a way that feels friendly and familiar? If we know each other really well, great. Even more the chance for you to offer in a way that we feel good together. 
hey, Tuffy, it's Amanda. I'm not saying, hi, I'm Amanda, nice to meet you, because we know each other. But I also don't want to make her work extra hard. So instead, I'm going to walk in. I'm going to stop moving six feet out, two arms length. And I'm going to say, hey, Tuffy, it's Amanda. Amanda. Hey, this is where if I am wanting to do something that requires hand under hand, I'm going to offer my hand to her. How I offer my hand is in line with my face in visual range. So if you're not practicing this, stand up and start from the beginning again and try it out. So you're gonna walk in, stop moving. Knock, knock. Hi, Tuffy, it's Amanda. Amanda. So that's it, that's the first step. I'm gonna offer, I'm gonna offer. If she does take my hand, if she reaches up her hand, then and only then I have permission to move in. Before that point, this is as close and as far as I get. So I saw a couple things come up in the chat. And I wanna do that before we shift forward into positive physical approach a little bit further. This seems like, yeah, it would be when I don't really know someone as well. Hmm. How would it be different if it were a spouse or a family member or a parent or somebody in a home setting? How would it look different? Should it be different? And what would we change? So, knock, knock. Hey, Taffy. Hey. It's Amanda. Amanda. Hmm. Why challenge a brain that's already finding lots of stuff difficult to come up with my name? If Teffy recognizes me as her mom, her friend, her sister, knock, knock. Hey, Teffy. It's Amanda. Well, of course it is. You're my sister. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to say my name more often. Oh. Yeah, girl at the store called me Andrea. Does it have to be awkward and uncomfortable every time? No. All we're doing with this approach is knock, knock, hi, an offer of who I am so that your brain doesn't have to work so hard to get there because the next things that we're gonna do may or may not require more energy. And if we're already connected and you already know who I am, even better. So once I'm in, I've offered my hand, she accepts. If she accepts my hand, and this is where hand under hand may or may not be appropriate, but I wanna shift and turn. So before we were standing here to deliver information, which is not as helpful, if I simply turn my body, what does that do for your visual field? Yeah, now you can see somewhere to go, somewhere to be, but also what are you not seeing? The thing I don't want you to touch. If I don't want you to touch it, then I should not be putting it within arm's reach right at eye level. So for both of us to be better protected, for both of us to feel safer and comfortable in this relationship, I start here. I offer the thing that I'd like you to touch, which is my hand. And when I offer my hand, if you accept it, then and only then we shake hands and I move forward 
and I get into what's called hand under hand, I turn to the side so that the thing you're looking at will be my face if I offer it and any visual cues. Ooh, I like those glasses. Oh yeah, thanks. Nice. Ooh, is that a sugar cookie or something else? Mm, sugar. You want it? Sugar. Ooh, that does look good. Mm -hmm. Is it green icing or some other color? Um, turquoise. Turquoise. Ooh, now that is beautiful. You you are a turquoise kind of gal. My favorite. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Something to drink with that cookie? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, coffee or water? I like the coffee. Yeah. I can't, can't remember how you take it. Come with me, help me out. Okay. Okay. All right. That's it. So, what did you notice we tried out in this situation? What were some of the skills that we used? Oh, Tifa's here, if you want to throw her into the panel too. <laughs> she did use some diamond skills to be able to chew and swallow before she answered. Nice, Melissa. So some visual cues, hand motions, positive physical approach, starting here, offering a hand, and then instead of front on, supportive stance keeps you and me focused on the things that we're doing here with my hands instead of on my physical body. Especially if impulse control is a concern and we may or may not have a relationship that is, if we're spouses and we're talking one of the younger dementias here, we may have a relationship where often this is an invitation if I'm wanting it to be something else, I need to change what I'm offering and show it differently so that I can have us focus on the thing that we're doing together. In this case, it was coffee. Because as Ann said earlier, what I see, I'll touch, I'll do. It's part of who I am. Okay, let's see. We are nearing the end here as far as what else we tried, but I did want to share with you a couple of the verbal pieces that we tried out that you may not have noticed because we were really looking at the visuals. So we did our positive personal, I'm sorry, positive physical approach, and then we added in some connections. I noticed Teffy had really nice glasses. I also noticed that she was eating something. So I did a greet and meet, hi, I am and you are. Again, it takes very little from us to offer our name up. And yet it's always there in case you're having trouble in that moment with some words, with some names, with a noun. I said something nice and then I noticed something in the environment. Then I asked, something to drink. I offered water or coffee. So the piece that, oops, the piece that we watched Tipa do was take it one step further and now support with hand under hand. But so far, what are you noticing are some pretty concrete skills that you could try out all along the way. How far away do you start a connection, an approach? What's the thing that we can always offer? Yeah, six feet, nice. My name, your name. My name, your name. Even if we have a really solid relationship, my name, your name. 
And then if I want touch, what do I want to ask permission? Ask permission if I want to touch. And what's the first thing that we touch? Hands. That allows me to get into intimate space where I can then be close enough that we can do other pieces. And every step of the way, if I want to say something, I want to show something. Let's not make our brains work so hard. Match what you're doing with what you're saying so that I can easily watch and listen and do. All right, what we're gonna do now for the last little bit is open it up to questions and or what if scenarios, but since Tipa's here, Tipa, anything you wanna share with the group on supportive care when FTD is in the mix? Um, the one thing I noticed Teffy was eating was glucose-based. Um, and one of the real interesting things about many dementias, but for sure FTD, but I've seen it with just about every dementia there is, is very frequently glucose becomes a favorite. Um, taking in that sugar, yeah, it gives you a little bit of rush. And so carbs and sugar tend to be something of note. So when Manda was near the end of her exercise and she said, hey, Taffy, coffee or something else, and Taffy was doing the coffee, if you hand Taffy the mug at that point, what would she, what would she have to consider doing in order to take the mug? Here, could you carry mine also? Here you go. Just hand her the mug. Here you go. Well, maybe. She might. Tef knowing Taffy, it's a possibility. If I could catch her in just the right transition point, and this is where learning about that, when is she done with a bite? And I could say, hey, Taffy, and put the mug right there where her hand is. So there's no really don't eat. Oh, my God, that's the third friggin' cookie you've had, Taffy. I mean, and you know you're diabetic. That idea of not shaming and not doing the blame game because that can that can escalate really pretty quickly i mean that's an interesting escalation to get between the two of you because one of you knows they're right and the other one knows you're probably right but it's none of your damn business at that point point. and this escalation that i'm giving you right now is the very first thing you might notice is all of a sudden i my tone of voice changes and my go to hell i don't you know what why are you always what do you always get in my face about this and I'm sure Anne has never experienced that, nor Michael, that idea of, you know, reacting to somebody trying to be helpful when it feels like you're mothering me or bossing me around. And so yeah, that, but we, uh, we talked about the people who experience the most trouble with impulse control and holding on to being right. And oftentimes the care partners mm -hmm. who are choosing to su support us through this journey. Um, and we yeah. oops that's inappropriate that's not right don't do that here yeah. don't do we don't do it like that yeah and so you know it's just so easy to just want to fix a little thing and it's so it's so hard to not want to help and it's just it's an autonomic almost reflex on the part of parents and what does that mean i'm treating you like and I never, I mean, it wasn't my intent. I just was bringing up something. And so that you have to be really careful with that. You know, I could, you know, after I have a relationship with Anne, I might could say, ah, cookie activity, huh? <laughs> and she'll let me know, uh-huh, and I'm going to finish it. Or, uh-huh, and yeah, I probably should. How many have I had? Wait a minute, let me think. Probably more than I meant to have. Um, because I'm stressed out because of this. I mean, and we can all justify whatever we want to, but just recognizing it's a, it's an adult you're working with and yeah. don't forget it. The hard part is you, in FTD, it's like I found myself eating off of my husband's plate. Yep. And he's like going, why are you eating on my plate? I don't know. I just started doing it. <laughs> I can see it. I can reach it. And it looks good. And it's not even hunger. I mean, you can't even, it's not even blaming. I mean, it's not that. It's, it's just an impulsive that. act. It's I hand and put it in there. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, trying to figure out what's a strategy that would keep us in a space that it'll work better for us. 
and that's right. what happened. That's what happens in a lot of care facilities. Mm -hmm. You get an FTD person in there, and because they tend to be on the young side, yep. they can wander around a lot, and they're going to other people's rooms to steal yep. food. Yep. Yep. And getting in the main refrigerator and taking things off of used mm. trays and, you know, and then the rule is that possession is nine tenths of the law. And so once I have it in my hand, it's safer. But once I get it in my mouth, it's safest because it's going to be hard for you to pry it out of my mouth. And so unfortunately, that can lead to some incredibly risky and dangerous situations where we have people shoving things in their mouth rapidly, like Taffy was doing, uh, demonstrating, so that we don't have that uh-oh. And it means I'll cling to my clothing so you can't get it off. And it means when, even though it's illogical, it's not about logic, it's just about, I don't think you got permission to do the thing you thought you had permission to do. And therefore, if I don't give you permission, you don't have it. <laughs> and we've got to figure out how to get permission from someone who in that moment may be fine with what's going on. How, but not with me doing something. And that's, it. we ask a lot of ourselves as care partners to pull the reins on ourselves while recognizing the person that we're, we're with at that same moment is exhibiting a behavior that when they are in their best moment, they go, oh man, I hate when I do that. It's so frustrating when I do that. I know better than doing that. And then how to deal with that, that disconnect between I know better, but I don't do better. So I'm just curious if Ann has that, that uh, it's not magic, it really isn't. It's just really hard work to go, yeah, but not right now. I mean, do you have any code words that you guys have developed that you can use or code behaviors? It's mostly I get the, the look or hand on my knee going, you know, like it's okay, you know, and I know what that means, it's either, uh -huh. Stop it or shut up now. <laughs> yeah. And so when I say code word, we want to have something just the two of us sort of know about. So I'm not calling you out and I'm not doing it as a public shaming. It, it's really our code for how we try to help one another through this. Because, I mean, we're trying hard to help one another. And it's just like trying to figure it out. There's no magic to it. It's hard work. Sometimes it works yeah. and sometimes it doesn't you still get a reaction that you wish you had. Um. Yeah, so this idea of letting go of being right and also being able to change your language in the moment mm -hmm. instead of shh, don't, stop, that offer of, ooh, something else that I'm okay with, this or that. Yeah. Because if... I come in and every time I'm the one telling you what you should be doing and where you should start and that you need to brush those teeth and that you need to do this thing. And that's not really my role and it really shouldn't be anybody's role because who's in charge of me? Well, that's me. But if you can, as a care partner, pull back on that need to tell me what I should be doing and instead offer two choices that you are actually okay with. Oh, my one had added tip, buy Vicks VapoRub and apply it right under your nose sometimes. Because sometimes what you smell triggers how you act. And if somebody has really bad breath, if somebody has body odor, if somebody smells of urine or feces, we got to really put the brakes on our knee-jerk reaction of, I can't believe that. Um, and so the first thing you do is smear Vicks Vapo. So you're really getting an alternate, you're either this or something else, this is the something else, so that when we basically pause ourselves, yeah, it smells like awful, but me commenting on it or reacting to it isn't probably going to take us where we want to go. Yeah. So when there's a mismatch of those senses, of the sensations, especially of smell, you're not noticing this is a safety thing. You're not realizing that you haven't brushed your teeth in two weeks because it's not something you really love to do. And you know what? It hurts every time it happens. So I might need for myself to bring my amygdala down 
to eliminate the smell factor so that I can continue through this with a conversational level instead of a need. Because if I need you to do something, I've already thrown this prefrontal out the window. And that's particularly important um, for somebody who's living alone and we only come in episodically and we're in and our brain is being blown away by the change in the location, the environment, the, the trash staying there, the spoiled food, things people are missing because that's just really not, they're not noticing. I mean, they're truly missing and not noticing and we have to really watch that because what we'll do is get them to shove us right back out the door. Um, which isn't going to help anything. So. so we're kind of at the end here. I know there were a couple of questions specifically about FTD. Feel free to reach out or we will hopefully provide some resources. It looked like Carrie is providing something um, a little bit later today at four o'clock Eastern time, if that's something that you're interested in. For those of you who were curious about um, physical support for movement variants that we talked about, earlier in the day. Uh, the afternoon sessions tomorrow are gonna be all about positive physical approach, language, and look for the one that's on hand under hand support. I think it's the second session, but I'll, I'll check it out and ask for more information from the speakers if you're not sure. Um, but we'll definitely cover that there and always reach out for uh, champion courses, because that's where we cover all of these skills and walk through them and talk through them. And you get mentor feedback in those. So that's a place where you can practice some of this stuff that we talked about. Man, you guys, it has been a long time, even though it feels like we just got started, but we're ready to wrap this thing up. Thank you so much to Michael and to Anne. All of your support, all of your feedback has been just life-changing. It's what I'm reading in the chat for people. Um, Anything you wanna leave anybody with? Any final words of advice or anything you wanna to say to wrap up today's session? Can't think of anything. All right, well, thank you so much. And uh, both of you have just sort of brought a new light to this for us, um, for sure. And keeping us honest and making us realize Many of us have a hard time with all of those skills up there in that prefrontal cortex. It is challenging. Life is hard. And if we choose to be in this together and accept when we've made mistakes, I'm sorry, I was trying to help. So thank you everybody for coming. We will see hopefully sometime later today. I think the next session is at three. Don't forget to rate the session and Join us on a different Zoom at three o'clock for the wrap up for today. All right, thanks guys. <laughs>